to answer your question. Um, also, if I speak a bit too fast English, because I can imagine you still have to train your ears to get used to it, uh, lectures in English, then please let me know. Of course, afterwards, so uh, the first two lectures will be taught here, also via live uh, broadcast or uh, here physically. Um, but the other lectures, I will re report them because, because of the time zone difference, it's really, I will have to wake up in the middle of the night in order to give my live uh, lecture. So uh, I will pre record them, but I will make sure that I won't pre record all lectures in, in a row so that I can also adjust and maybe answer some questions or if I see that because of the homework or during the exercise, if there are some questions coming up, then maybe elaborate on those during the class. Feel free to come in. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, today's topic is historical ciphers and breaking them. So because of the historical ciphers are not super secure, uh, we will still see how to uh, break them. Uh, so this is not really diving straight super deep into cryptography. It's sort of more of a teaser and see how historically cryptography grew in uh, some more well, way more research topic and, uh, well, but it all started with some basics. But before we start with the actual course content, um, I can find my mouse. Oh, no, my computer crashed. I told you I have some of this. <laughs> I got a super crappy computer for this trip. I thought uh, it's fine enough, but uh, it crashed. <laughs> so I'm going to press on to the next slide. I, 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 if somebody else can, I can do that. So maybe. Uh, what was the Because I have to reboot my computer in order to try to get it online, but maybe somebody else can. So the the also maybe for the people at home, uh, you can also find the slides already on the uh, on the tech digital tech. So, okay. uh, uh, you want to have a look at them yourself uh, while I present, and uh, maybe skip back or move a bit ahead. Then you can. Yes, yes. Yes. Ya, ya está bien, está bien. Por lo menos a mí no me sale para allá, digamos, la materia de este y no es que no me sale. Ah, sí, a preguntar, ¿ya le sale? No, no, no. ¿Cómo va a ser esta? ¿Sale esta? ¿Sale de la? Ah, ok. ¿Y será que se puede compartir alguna ahorita? Pues para ir viendo la ley. ¿Qué hacer? Para que se haya entendido la it's good that we don't start too early because we are still dropping in. <laughs> Three and 
Yes, 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 And we know how to present as the rules. Then so we can just share this. Uh, yeah. So sorry for the delay, but uh, it will be worth it. Trust me. <laughs> Otherwise, you have this stupid slideshow and the. Ah, uh, yes, that's, this is way better. And then, um, ah, uh, for a queue, maybe a queue, and then a queue. Okay, so it's not going to be <laughs> ah, yes, perfect. Although now we still need to present. <laughs> ah, luckily, uh, we don't start too early, so that's good. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. This is really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> so, welcome. <laughs> Uh, I just had an uh, introduction already uh, about uh, that we will be in English, and uh, well, maybe you can watch back the recording if you want to stop uh, by uh, a little bit late. Um, but here, uh, I just wanted to start with what the course, uh, what we will need for this course, and a little bit about the course outline. So, uh, for, uh, for the course, we will use a uh, specific book. Uh, I will add slides uh, based on the material in the book, but I also really urge you to read the chapters to, uh, belonging to this slide. So for there are certain chapters, and uh, for every chapter there is a slide deck. And uh, but really, it's really helpful for yourself to not only uh, watch the lectures but also read the chapter from the book. Um, Maybe some things you can skip uh, if you think it's not important or uh, if you don't really, uh, you know, if it's not super, super forward in class. Um, if, it's, if it's something mandatory to read, which I don't cover, then I will say so. Uh, but otherwise, uh, well, just please read the chapters. Uh, the book is actually a big book. Uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this document object identifier uh, goes to a Springer link uh, thing where you can uh, can buy it and uh, uh, yourself. But if you uh, are uh, uncomfortable, if you if you cannot buy it yourself, you can. I also get the old version of the book, which is also by Nigel Smart. Um, who is, by the way, a famous photographer, so it's a really good book. Um, and this book, the previous version, is called Cryptography An Introduction. Um, also, if you're maybe a bit less ethic, if you just title, if you put the title of the <laughs> book in uh, Google, you will be fine to see that. <laughs> so, for this course, um, I will try to use the tech digital uh, for uploading the slides, like I said. Uh, also, the assignments will be uploaded there. Um, but maybe it's better for communicating if you have a quick question uh, and because of the time zone difference later, it may be nice to use Slack 
So I set up a Slack workspace uh, in the PDF. You can click on this link and then uh, you should be able to, uh, to register for that Slack. Uh, if at some point uh, it expires, please tell somebody else and uh, we'll find a way in order to uh, get you uh, onto Slack again. So for the course content, uh, or the grading actually, so uh, this course will be graded on three different uh, well, things, topics. Uh, there will be homework assignments. Uh, I'm not sure yet if every class will have homework assignments. Sometimes they're really short, like one or two questions. Sometimes they're a bit more involved. Uh, actually, this the first one is a bit more involved. Uh, but I think they're all really manageable and they account for 30% of the grade. Uh, and you, because uh, the, the homework will be, uh, you have to hand in on Mondays uh, before the lecture and always at least one week later. So if the lecture is on Thursday, I don't expect you to hand it in on, on the next Monday, but then the uh, Monday thereafter. Um, there will also be one or two, or actually there will be two lab assignments. Um, the lab assignments are basically also homework assignments, but a bit both. You can program a bit and uh, well, get your hands dirty on the, on the, on the assignment. Um, and because they are also a bit more involved, I strongly urge you to do it in pairs. So find somebody else uh, to uh, work together with. Uh, if you really want to do it alone, you're also able to. Uh, and if you're really, everybody is already taken and you can only find a third person, so you're a group of three, then it's also allowed. But preferably groups of two and groups of three, maybe one group of three person. Um, then finally, there will also be an exam uh, because I won't be invigilating <laughs> I already see uh, <laughs> uh, But the, the exam is uh, not a typical exam, I guess, for, for most of you. Um, it's it's a uh, fixed amount of uh, time that you will have. Uh, you won't be able to communicate, but I will release the, uh, the exam. And uh, you can just look up everything yourself. It's open book. And then uh, you have to solve some assignments in a, in a certain time limit and uh, you have to handle it. Uh, there's also a note, so everything uh, for the exam, everything is considered except for the last week, uh, because the last week is super close to the exam date, so to give you a bit more time to study for the exam, uh, you, we you exclude the last week. And it also means that the actual last week will be a bit more advanced topics and more for your interest uh, to, to, spike you, to, to, yeah, to to get you more interested into what's more, what's, uh, what the cryptography has to offer. So uh, because there are five weeks then um, and uh, two lectures a week, there are actually 10 topics. There's also our text. Mostly, there are the exact names of the chapters also in the book. So today we will start with the historical ciphers. Uh, well, we'll come to that uh, in a moment. Um, and on Thursday, we'll cover information theoretic security. It's a really nice topic. It's a really huge topic on its own. There's a lot of research on there. And what you can do there is you can prove um, that your scheme is really, un uh, your crypto system is really unbreakable. So you can really prove that no matter what you do, you cannot break it. Uh, but there is a catch there, and we will cover that in the uh, 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 next class. Uh, why this is still used that much? Um, so then uh, in the next lecture, we will cover security definitions because. Uh, it's not that trivial to define how, wh one, when is something secure? When is an encryption scheme? When, when, when is it really manual text? So you cannot see what's underneath there and what's the plain text. So, uh, and there are different definitions there. We will cover actually, I believe maybe even nine, although there are just two different axes, so three times three. 
Um, and uh, that's just nice to get basics, although this is very computer science information, uh, computer theoretical topic. Uh, then we'll go to uh, stream cybers. Welcome to the seat. <laughs> um, stream cybers are typical, as a special type of uh, methods where you can encrypt things with or also sign or actually Mac. Block uh, cybers are another way of uh, encryption technique. Uh, then we'll move on to hash functions. Probably, I hope you at least uh, know what hash functions are. But we'll look at secure, cryptographically secure hash functions. Yes, you're here for the security uh, course. I see, I already started. <laughs> uh, so we uh, will also cover methods of authentication codes. There's basically these are the signatures, although then in a symmetric key setting and not in a asymmetric key setting. Uh, and key derivation functions, so how to securely generate new randomness from a small set of randomness, as far as that's possible. Now we will spend one entire lecture on just the RSA algorithm uh, and just the plain mathematical basics about the RSA algorithm. So for that, you would need to learn a bit about the groups or recall uh, the group theory and uh, well, stuff like this. Um, and then in the, the next lecture, we will start to actually see how it's not just use the stupid textbook uh, uh, algorithm, but it's actually quite more involved in order to use the RSA algorithm securely to do it uh, quite some different uh, tricks. Um, and finally, we will cover uh, uh, certificates or well, PKI, basically, uh, public key infrastructure and the like, and also key agreements, so how can you securely set up uh, uh, communication between two parties who don't know each other yet. Yeah, yeah Bithy Hamon, exactly, that's what we'll call there. And then the last one, it's already slightly moving towards more advanced topics or uh, more uh, besides for top of, uh, the encryption things, is uh, uh, secret sharing schemes. Um, well, we will cover that uh, in that class uh, to learn what uh, that actually is. So that's a bit for the course content. Um, are there any questions so far about the course, like uh, the, the, the the grading scheme or uh, the the math assignments? Uh, which programming language? So the question is which uh, lab uh, the programming language for the lab assignments. I have a strong preference for Python, but I'm not sure if all of you know or are that comfortable with Python. So um, I, I really don't mind actually that much which programming language you use. I'm fine if you use Java. Uh, you can also use C. Uh, you can use, uh, well, whatever language uh, you, you want, but be sure to document your code and uh, always hand in your code indeed and also hand in the results that your code produced. And maybe I won't be able to compile it or, or myself or so, but at least I can have a look at the code. Uh, like, And of course, maybe I'm not fluent in that language. I can still grade it and see if you've done the steps correctly. So basically, any program language is good as long as you document it a bit. Another question? About code documentation, you need to write in English. Everything in English, uh, <laughs> because I don't speak Spanish. But uh, uh, you weren't here yet before, but I already explained. If you uh, if you have questions and you're not comfortable or you don't know how to translate it to, uh, in English, just ask your peers or online, just use a search engine uh, translation. And then uh, I think we will manage. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I think. Sorry? Evaluation. Evaluation. So that was a few slides back. Ah, that, this oh, okay. slide, uh, maybe you can read it later uh, okay. uh, online. And if you have some questions, uh, I also told before that there is a Slack workspace. So you can ask your questions there if uh, something is still up there or watch the recording back. Okay. Oh. 
I don't know if you mentioned already, but what about the uh, the thumbs up on the different thing? How, how are we gonna? So uh, probably we won't meet physically or uh, not not at the same time zone, but uh, that's why I have the Slack, and I hope we can just write messages. And if there's really a need, then maybe we can we can always see if there's a if there's a time slot where both of us are available when I'm back in the Netherlands, which is eight hours plus, and this is well, compared to this time zone. So we well. If there's a need, just ask for Slack and we uh, will see what we can do. So you will be doing the course, the whole course? Yes, but the first two lectures I will be here mm -hmm. and the rest of the lectures they will be pre-reported. Um, sure. And then you can watch them at your own leisure. Uh, well, probably I will either put them on YouTube or Gmail, I'm not sure yet. So you will report the whole sessions and then Watch. Yes, yes, and I will, uh, but I won't record them all at once, so you can ask questions in the meantime uh, for the next, uh, maybe in the next recording I can cover something if something wasn't clear. That's because of the difference of time. Of some time. Yes. Time okay. Uh, yes, uh, if there are no more questions. Okay, good. Then uh, let's start out with actually having a bit of an idea of what is cryptology. So cryptology you can uh, divide into two parts, and it's cryptography, cryptography and cryptanalysis. And uh, well, cryptography is like it says here, it's more of a constructive method. So it's making schemes or algorithms uh, in order to 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 prevent somebody to read something or prevent some misuse of, uh, of a statement. Um, so this is all constructing. And cryptanalysis is actually breaking the things that people constructed and then try to, to well, to read a ciphertext, to break the ciphertext, uh, to break a hash function. That's all cryptanalysis. But this part we will focus on cryptography, except for this first class, where we will also see this, this historical cycles and also how to break them. So, and I, I like to divide also cryptology into another axis, uh, where I usually divide it by uh, symmetric key crypto and asymmetric key crypto, because to me, there are really two worlds different apart. Uh, we will start with the symmetric key crypto. We will spend quite some, I believe, at least five lectures about this. Um, so actually, then it's about half half because the other rest, uh, the, the rest is more public key crypto or uh, the like. Uh, and uh, so for symmetric key crypto, you can think of block ciphers, stream ciphers, these uh, messages of authentication codes. Uh, but I also like to encompass uh, hash functions and random number generators also under symmetric crypto, although it's not a key in random number generators. But also key derivation functions, etc. Those are all under the umbrella of symmetric key crypto. And uh, the asymmetric key crypto is, for example, public key encryption like the RSA uh, algorithm or signatures. Uh, and remind you again the signatures, you have signatures in public key and that's the multiplication codes in symmetric key. That's the terminology. But we'll come to this uh, later. So then it's also maybe good to see what are the goals of, of cryptography and how do we reach those goals. So in the middle we have just cryptography and uh, on the outskirts we have uh, the goals. So maybe the first goal that most people think of considering cryptography is confidentiality, which is basically encryption. So with encryption, you can hide something so you can keep something secret or confidential. And uh, so there are both uh, sides of the three sides, it's symmetric and uh, asymmetric is the public key crypto. And then maybe most people next think of uh, authentication or data authentication, 
uh, which is basically you want to be sure that if the data that you have is untampered, it's not modified, and it's really the it's yeah, it's authenticated. Um, and, and actually, there is a nice overlap because cryptography only only makes sure uh, for confidentiality and nothing about data integrity. That's just the definition. Although it's super nice because most people think when they encrypt something that also the data is not is not uh, is untemperable. And that's why they invented a new crypto theme topic, which is called authenticated encryption, which uh, makes sure that if you encrypt a message under such an authenticated encryption scheme, uh, you get both data confidentiality and data authenticity. So you, the message is really the message. If you decrypt it, then you can be sure that this is really the message that was encrypted. And that is because someone that can decrypt, you know, generally, as you know, the patients can, you know, alter the data. Well, alter the data, right? So, so then encrypt it again. It's it's even more complicated. So uh, if you if you have a, a message and you encrypt it under a simple encryption scheme, then even if you don't have the encryption or decryption key, sometimes you can still change the underlying message okay. in such a way that it's it's you. Then maybe it says I want to transfer uh, five dollar to this bank account, and you can change it. I want to transfer ten dollar into this bank account. And of course, it's really bad if that happens to your bank because then you suddenly you pay double. Uh, so the, even though you simply yes, because encryption oh. is really only about data confidentiality okay. and nothing about data authentication. Okay. But we will come to this also at a later point. So don't worry if you you know have to re re uh, recall everything uh, on the spot. Um, Okay, then we also have entity authentication. So instead of data authentication, we have entity authentication. And what that means is that if I sign a message, you can be sure that, and, and I send the message to you, and you receive the message, then you can be sure it's really from me and not uh, from uh, some other guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, you really show that something about your uh, notifications. Yes, actually, it's super close to uh, origin non recreation, and that's that's basically the the, the thing where you uh, you cannot fool somebody else into believing that uh, this message came from somebody else. Or, um, so what's uh, uh, done here is these Max again, these message authentication codes, signatures, uh, digital signatures, and Max is uh, symmetric, asymmetric. And also zero knowledge groups. I'm not sure if we're able, and we have to see a bit how the class goes, but maybe we will be also in these last uh, two lectures, we'll cover a bit about the zero knowledge groups. It's a really nice topic. Uh, and there you can prove in zero knowledge, which means that uh, you don't review anything else, some aspects. So, for example, uh, uh, I know of a, a system in the Netherlands that was developed uh, where you had a card and you uh, you could show this uh, it was a digital card with digital signatures or like signature like on there. There were actually zero knowledge proofs on there, and then you could show that you were, uh, for example, over eighteen in order to buy liquor at the store. Well, you were weren't revealing anything else, so uh, not your birthday or exactly how old you were. But you only review I'm over 80. And you can do the, all those nice things with zero knowledge groups. And it's really cool advanced topic. Uh, but we will see if we will cover that. Yes, the question. Does Max stand for methods of authentication codes? Right. But of course, when we will cover that topic, we will uh, so we will cover later on those topics. Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention on the slide that is hash functions and uh, hash functions are usually they're also called digests, so to summarize a blob of text into a short message digest, so short message summary, uh, to and then you sign or you 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 mac uh, those uh, the the output of this hash function, so you can actually way more easily 
prove that the, the, the data is correct. Although you then need to trust the hash function as well, that the hash function is, is uh, correctly uh, yeah, compressing the data and you cannot alter anything with it. But we will also cover that later. So this is a bit of an overview, which we will mostly cover, maybe a zero knowledge proof as well. Let's see uh, what the time. Uh, but you can use any kind of public and private. Well, we'll cover both public and private, uh, well, public key cryptography and symmetric key cryptography. We will cover uh, those. Okay. And for today, we will cover the symmetric key live, but then the very old ones, the historical ciphers. Okay. Tim, the, the previous slide, what was the difference between entity authentication and origin number authentication? Actually, to be honest, I now that I put it on here, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but uh, I think um, but maybe, I, was, I was under that impression. That's what I'm asking. I was under the impression it's kind of the same. Right? Yeah, it's, it's either super close or it's the same. I have to come back to this. Uh, I will look it up and uh, I, will, uh, I will text it on the Slack channel. Great question. <laughs> Um, so before we start looking at the, the defining crypto schemes or algorithms, uh, let's actually first have a look at the notation for uh, cryptography so we were all on the same page. Uh, usually a plain text you denote with the letter M, and uh, I hope you know the symbol that's in or below to a set B. Uh, in cryptography, because cryptographers are not really mathematicians, uh, they you instead of using the word set, they use often space. So they call P the plain text space uh, because they don't often formally define what the set is. Because maybe if you have a block cipher that operates on a block of uh, 256 bits, then the set is just all possible values in that block. Um, but yeah, uh, so it, usually it's clear from context what the set is, but it's often not explicitly defined. Then uh, for Cyberflex, it's the same. We usually use C and the Cyberflex space. So C is an element of the Cyberflex space. Key uh, keys the same as well. So you see there key space that I use. Here, maybe the notation starts to get a bit less familiar. Uh, to, so the key generation algorithm, you could write as, uh, this is a specific key generation algorithm, uh, where it actually means that you uh, select uh, the, a key K uniformly at random from uh, the set capital K. What does uniformly at randomly mean if you don't know about hard directly means that, for example, if I have a set of 10 keys, uh, it's as likely as I would pick the key number five as key number nine. So every every key is uh, chosen with the same probability, so uniformly at random. And that's why we also use this arrow that denotes it's not actually an equal sign. Because we, it's it's drawn from a distribution. It's not really an assignment because well, it's a probability. For encryption, we actually have in the symmetric case. We often have that it's actually uh, an assignment. So we, we, we encrypt the message M using a key K, and we get a ciphertext. We will also see in the future that actually encryption algorithms that really does a deterministic encryption is really bad. It's actually weak. So often we uh, in in, uh, in symmetric key cryptos we do some extra steps in order to randomize the the ciphertext output, and then you will see this error notation again. Or I will use it. The book actually doesn't use it that often. They use often just the equal sign, but I will stick to um, the arrow. Just I find it more clear. Uh, the encryption algorithm, of course, is always deterministic. Or actually, there are also some exceptions there, but we won't cover those. 
Um, so for this class, we can assume that the encryption is always deterministic. So if we have a ciphertext and a key, then we get back the message. Um, well, like I said before, cryptographers are a bit weird mathematicians. Uh, so in math, you people prefer to use sing single letter symbols. So they don't use uh, uh, well long function names, etc. So actually, you also see often just a letter E as a function E and a letter D for decryption. Uh, but well, because I think it's slightly more clearer if I just write it out. Uh, I write it out like this. this of course, I will use the operator front because otherwise it's like E times N times T. Please also consider that when you're making your own assignments. Um, then there is also an alternative notation, which you, if you read crypto papers, you will see lots of notations uh, going through. Um, here, for example, I use a more cryptographers like definition uh, with a two letter. Uh, variable name of P PT for plain text, CT for sharp text, and for a key, often if we will use a public key encryption, encryption it becomes you need to distinguish between a private and a public key. Uh, well, they both start private and public, both start with P, so you can use PK and PK. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we often use a uh, secret key and a uh, public key for. Are uh, yeah, actually, I think the one key. Yeah. So, uh, for, for, for symmetric key, we only have one key. So, we use all of this uh, as a secret key. Then, again, this key generation um, algorithm is a bit complicated here. Uh, so, highlighted here. Uh, well, I already explained the, the error notation. So, it means that this algorithm here, PGEN, is actually probabilistic. So we don't know up front what, what SK will be if we run this algorithm. If we run it twice, it might give us two different outputs. Um, and we, the, our, uh, the, the algorithm takes one argument, which is one to power lambda. And this is a really, really fundamental, hardcore uh, computer science uh, stuff. I'm not sure if you recall the, 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 the things you would learn about Turing machines. No. <laughs> so uh, with Turing machines, uh, you're, it's a fundamental uh, concept about uh, what is a computer, what can you compute. Uh, it's about uh, so uh, algorithms. Uh, you can uh, uh, complexity classes of algorithms and stuff you can do like this with that. Um, and uh, the third machine is the most basic form of a computer where you have an input tape and you can take one step on the, at a time to, to change something on the tape, uh, move the tape left, move the tape right, etc. And what this notation really means is that you put lambda number of symbols onto the tape. So uh, it's unary notation. So binary notation would be that you put there one or zero or, uh, or just uh, yeah, binary. <laughs> but uh, here uh, you can represent uh, 16, for example, in how many bits? Uh, four? Or what, what, what? One, two, four, uh, eight, six, so five uh, bits. But if you if you would represent 16 in unary notation, you need 16 symbols. That's just basically what it is. And why do we use it here? It's again a very formal uh, notation because later uh, um, we will see that this is needed for security because if we 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 will we will want to have that if we put let's say 16 numbers on the Turing tape. It will take not double or uh, triple or squared or uh, well any polynomial number of steps in order to break it. But we will say that we actually need to have more than a polynomial number of steps of 16. If you can imagine something about this, 
um, in order to break this. So it basically says something, if we increase the length of this input table, then we need to have way more, uh, you could think of exponential, yeah. you need to have exponential more steps in order to break it. So that's usually when you add uh, with cryptography, uh, if you add just uh, uh, one extra bit, it will take twice as long to break uh, the, the, the encryption system. Maybe it's a good encryption system. But, but, uh, but it's not a binary, it's real. Sorry, that is uh, real number. Uh, yes, it's, a binary, binary. Yes, it, yeah, but it's it's just it's just a formal thing. Mm -hmm. So it's just if you have a Turing machine and you would program the entire algorithm on the Turing machine, you would just put that many numbers on the input tape and uh, then run the Turing machine. But it's if you don't, Turing machine, Turing, Turing, not machine. Turing not sorry, not sorry, not Turing. Okay. Um, but actually, if you didn't follow at all what I just said, that's fine. <laughs> you won't really need to know this, but it's maybe nice because you will see this a lot used in papers. If you ever read these papers, and there's really no explanation on the internet on how what this means, but now hopefully you know this background information. So you read one, two, then no. Actually, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's 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 unary notation, and you put lambda, uh, lambda number of symbols on to a tape. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, the the other algorithms are just now self-encrypted. It's just uh, and it's now encrypted. Uh, one more thing that is. Uh, this is called an algorithm, this is an algorithm, and this is an algorithm. And the collection of, alg of, a, uh, of collection of algorithms is actually called a scheme. So an encryption scheme is the encryption algorithm, the decryption algorithm, and the way in order to generate a key. So you said the way to generate the key? Yeah, so the way to generate the key is an algorithm. But if you combine the, the key generation algorithm with the encryption and decryption algorithm, you, you get a scheme. Okay. There are a number of schemes. Well, there are different schemes. So, for example, there are uh, public key encryption schemes like RSA or LGMAL, uh, but there are also uh, symmetric key algorithms like uh, AAS, uh, DES, triple DES, okay. double DES, Blowfish, yeah. There are many. And there's maybe that's uh, good to realize. Is maybe I'll just ask you, do you know if there's also an hashing scheme? Mm -hmm. yeah, what's that? An hashing scheme? Hashing scheme. Oh, just one algorithm. Yeah, so it's usually just one algorithm. So I it's maybe it's a one way property, right? Yes, yes. So it's uh, because it's just one algorithm, you Nobody talks about hashing schemes because it's just an algorithm. So, just to, yes? I think if you're not changing the topic or we might get time for. I will just yeah, finish this slide. Yeah, yeah. But, but thanks for reminding me. Also, please tell me if you, if you think it's too tiring and need to have a break. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt. Uh, but, uh, Finish this slide because then we are at the, at the end of the terminology section, even. Um, so, this is just to get you a bit used to how these definitions are made. Uh, so, actually, of course, there's one important property that we want for an encryption scheme is if we encrypt something, we get a ciphertext. We want to, if we then use the right key to decrypt it, we want to recover the original message. We don't want to get out of some weird other <laughs> message. So that's basically what we define here. So for all keys that we can choose, if we encrypt something, so we get a ciphertext here, then we decrypt it with the same K, so the same key, we get back exactly the same M. Sorry, get it because it's some symmetric encryption. That's the same key. Yes, uh, you're, uh, yes, uh, because of symmetric encryption, you use the same key that the LSS. Yeah. 
Uh, I think this was the last thing, yes, for the terminology slide. So then this is a nice time to have a break. So let's say uh, 15 minutes or so. So like 15 past uh, six. Orden. Son 30 por ciento de tareas, 40 de lápiz, si no me equivoco, más de dos laboratorios, tres semanas, tres y seis, que pueden ser en paredes. ¿Los laboratorios ya están hechos por él? Sí, creo que el, todo lo van a hacer, no va a armar, digamos, lo va a hacer. Sí, 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 sí. Y lo que falta, que son 30, un examen. ¿Un examen? Un examen teórico. ¿Un examen de cuánto más? 30 por ciento. Que va a ser teórico, a libre abierto, pero sí es.
So you should uh, have an analysis
a ghost, you're, you're, you're not required to declare the owner, so you can say. So we can do more of that time than uh, but uh, I don't think it's uh, a problem. Uh, actually, there will be uh, quite some more slides, but um, well, let's see. Uh, we also have plenty of time because we have until eight, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's uh, start the immediately. So the first uh, encryption algorithm. Uh, that was ever known to mankind was actually an algorithm we thought of as legend said, used by Julius uh, Caesar or Kaiser. Uh, and, and what he did in order to encrypt his messages, he shifted every letter in the alphabet to positions. So the A goes to C, maybe the C from Caesar. Uh, and the B goes to D, C goes to B. E, etc., until you reach this end. And then, of course, now the, the S goes to Y, Z, uh, so that goes to Z, but the Y, there's nothing here, so if you just go back 
and then you go to the letter A. So you just compute the model O, already something you will, will also see later. Um, so we will wrap around and go back to the beginning. So if you complete this picture, it will look like this messy thing. And Caesar only used just this thing. So there's no key. There's only an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm, which is deterministic and uses no key. So it's always too, always too bad to decrypt. Of course, this is pretty simple cycle, so we can extend this and make it with a key. So instead of having only the two, we can also change uh, how many characters we shift. So we can represent this like a uh, sort of wheel. Maybe you can actually make it yourself uh, to e help you into uh, encrypting something. And then uh, you can put the letter A and the C, or uh, the key is equal to two, and you see, uh, okay, the U transfers to Y, uh, if I have a K, then it will become the N, etc. And in order to decrypt, you just go from out in words, so uh, R goes to P. Now, if you then chase, you have to spin onto the wheel, and you change the key to 15, then the letter A becomes P, etc. So this is one way of work to visualize how this uh, encryption uh, scheme works and decryption as well. Key generation here is, of course, you just pick a key between which which the numbers between uh, somebody has an ID. What uh, what 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 are all possible keys? What is the key space? National number. National yeah. real numbers. Real numbers, you say? Natural numbers. Natural numbers could be, but would it make sense to have a key 158? <laughs> well, it depends, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. but you know, something to realize is also once, once we spend more than 26, because there are 26 letters in the English alphabet, oh, which is here, yeah. then we wrap around again, mm -hmm. also with the key. So actually there are only 26 possible keys. So 26 is the same as no, no change. So it's the key zero is the same as key 26. Key one is the same as key 27. Because I think it's nice also to see some things in code. Uh, like I said, my preferred language is Python uh, because I think it's also super easy to uh, read. Um, so how would you implement this uh, cipher in Python? Mm -hmm. You would iterate for every character of, of your plain text message, <laughs> and then just look up the position. The the, the position. Um, okay, you, you first define the alphabet, which is just A B C D etc. until Z, or you can define also maybe the Spanish alphabet with the and with the tilde on there. Mm -hmm. um, so you just define an alphabet. And then um, what you now do in order to encrypt a message, you encrypt character by character. So for each character in your plain text, you look up uh, something, a, a letter in the alphabet, and which letter? Or well, basically the one that you. The, the, the position that you have, plus your key, because your key is just a number, and you wrap around modulo the alphabet, because that's how many keys you can have. Like 26 letters, we had 26 possible keys. And then you join them all together, and we still have the, the, the encryption algorithm. Something interesting to see is, I only define crypt, not encrypt, decrypt, because it's trivial to, uh, to make the encryption into a decryption. How? Somebody has an idea? Oh. If, uh, if the key, let's say uh, it's five, how do we now decrypt using this algorithm? Minus five, we need super, uh, we just put a minus in front of there. Uh, also, one thing to observe is uh, I use here also just really, again, this uh, computer science formal. Words like alphabet, uh, and uh, here I use C for character, but actually sometimes I will also use um, uh, symbol 
or uh, token. Or... So they're just these formal, uh, I'm not sure if you had this language classes, like it's just when you also talk about Turing machines, you also talk about all of that stuff like this. Um, yeah, that's just a simple Python implementation. This works, you can run it. What do you mean it works? Yeah, it's a real code. It's a real encryption algorithm, but if it's secure, that's the second thing. Okay. It's a proper, it's just, I this is encryption, but <laughs> maybe it's not so secure. <laughs> okay. Um, so then we'll come to that in a moment. First, uh, let's see again the formal definition of what we just saw. So, uh, just the formal text. So, to encrypt the plain text PT under a key K, we compute uh, the surtext for position I. Uh, we compute it as the plain text position I with some of apply to some operation, the key. So what do we see immediately for this definition? Encryption is done character per character. Just like we also saw in the code example, we iterate of this character from the message. And what we see, we, we just apply the same key to every uh, character in the message. Uh, so what for this operation, we just, Again, use uh, like if you think of uh, abstract algebra, you also use all times these weird symbols like a plus sign. It could mean a real plus sign. It could also mean a plus sign in a group, or uh, well, so something different. So uh, that's why I also use it here because actually here we use the uh, what we saw before with the with the the, the shift in letters. We actually have also that uh, we we can represent we can view this as uh, an operation in a cyclic group where the group elements are just the letters. So here, for example, uh, the group consists of A until Z. So you can also represent those by the numbers zero until twenty five or one to six to you and. And uh, then the sixth group operation is just you just do your 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 letter turns into a number plus uh, the key, but then at model level twenty six again because we wrapped around. So if we had if we had for example the letter uh, Y, so that's twenty four. If we count it in zero, then, uh, and then we and if the key is five. We end up 29, but the model, but then we would go all the way here again for this. Uh, if you remember this, this, uh, this picture I was referring to, so like 29, and then uh, 29 is actually the same as uh, four, right? So now it's uh, five uh, because we have, uh, no, it's uh, three. Sorry, <laughs> you said it already, right? So then it will be uh, six less C. But uh, if, we, if we are a bit, uh, if we enjoy the math, we can just write it like this and we see uh, it's a cyclic group. But if you didn't get this, it's all right. So, um, it's just a fun fact. <laughs> Why is it a fun fact? Because here I get. Just define a slight variation um, where instead of this operator uh, is now, like we saw here before, the operator is now not defined as an operation plus into in a in a in a six in a modulus ring group whatever. Um, we now define it as a XOR operation. I hope you're all familiar with XOR ring. So uh, it's super uh, nice in uh, computers because it's super fast to do it like this. And if you actually look at uh, lots of uh, ransomware or malware, lots of routines in there to for the malware to encrypt itself, they're just using SOAR uh, uh, ciphers. 
So they just implement this only, and then they don't care that the key is hidden somewhere. So, but you have to reverse engineer to see the key first. So that's already a hassle, but the encryption is really not really an encryption. Um, so this is actually used way more than the other thing. And why? Because the code to write it is way simpler. Um, so you see here, for example, this is uh, in Python, it's really one line. You can just uh, take a character from the message and take a character from the key. And if you, if you reach the end of the key, which is only one character, you use it again. That's what cycle does. And you just store the first uh, the character per character this uh, message with the key. Um, let me first uh, 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 finish the slide. Um, and uh, why is this short variant maybe nicer? Because here you can write in bytes instead of only uppercase characters or whatever character you had before. Because, uh, well, if you had this alphabet and uh, you have some weird characters in there, maybe you can't shift. Uh, you have to define what the order of the alphabet is. And here it's clear because you just operate on bytes. Um, and I, I already mentioned this, but it's really, really, really super fast. Of course, if you just, it's just one assembly instruction. The other question. Um, this is subject to two. To, um, that idea that the yeah, key should be the same length as the message, right? Yes. Um, although, of course, if you if you, your key uh, for so for example, if this is uh, the, the, the byte, and uh, if your if your key is uh, a bit, then you just add it to zeros. Uh, but indeed, then you it's even worse encryption. <laughs> <laughs> Still, an encryption algorithm. But indeed, uh, or so are you would. Operate views near the same length, yes. That was your question. Um, um, they should cycle the key because where do we use in this bit? Yes, I, 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 I don't recall it. Um, was it better cycling the key? So, uh, I, I, this is a bit maybe a co more complicated way of writing it uh, than necessary, but here we see we use all the time the same key. And it's just a bit of Python code that you can still use zip in order to say, well, I just said K the whole time. Actually, you could also just write it as maybe pour A in message and then A sort with K. That's maybe clearer. But as we will see later on, there will be a slightly improved version of this uh, shift cipher where we actually use a key of a, of a different length. And then it's maybe if you want to use uh, the, the Python in your homework assignments or lab assignments, I should say, uh, then you can already copy this and you can actually already, if you now make key two symbols on, then it will automatically do this correctly. That's why I put this more complicated thing. Okay, um, then we'll move on to the next slide. If there are no more questions. So let's look at the security of this because we now we find a super cool encryption algorithm. So we're all done, we think, but uh, now it's actually uh, super weak. So the first weakness we maybe uh, can uncover is the keys, uh, key space or the set of keys that we can choose from is way too small. And basically, what it means, you can brute force, or in nicer terms, you can say you exhaustively search or enumerate all possible keys. And just to show you this, because I really like um, well, it's clear. Um, I really like uh, this uh, this program. You can find it on the internet. Uh, it's called Sarkcap. And it's also a great tool if you're playing CPFs. You can solve lots of things using C uh, for CTFs just quickly with a starter chef. Um, but uh, what this does is just uh, some simple tool where you can uh, do all kinds of simple operations onto uh, your inputs and you get your outputs. 
And for example, here I put a SARS text in there. And then uh, I just uh, start sorry, sorry, just brute force uh, all possible case for me. And then we'll use the sort operation. And then, well, it turns out I'm going to go ready D4. As you already see that it was just this is a SARS text. And then you see that the scroll bar is not that big. <laughs> so it, even if you have to go manually by, to view all the different SARS texts, you can still easily see. If it's uh, if it, which which one is the correct key? So this is a really weak encryption operator. That cipher um output um EP accelerated. Uh, if the if the cipher is UPD accelerated. Uh, well, uh, XOR is just on the CPU is already super fast. Uh, I think on the GPU it's like it will be as fast. But the CPU is already super fast. I think on the GPU it will be as fast. But you can paralyze them. But it, it's already so fast on the CPU, it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> this is, by the way, a web app. This is also a link. You can click on the CyberChef if you have the slides uh, there. Uh, you can play around. You can, I will, in the, in the lab assignments, I also refer to it. So maybe you will use it, but you cannot do everything with it. But it's, uh, it's a nice tool to play around. So there's a lot of cryptography things in there. So you can do all kinds of encryptions and decryptions with, uh, with the web tool. Okay, but uh, that was the first weakness, weakness uh, we saw, that there was just a very small uh, key space. But actually, there's also another more fundamental weakness. And that is um, each symbol is encrypted in the same way. So, um, yeah, we, we saw it already that with the, the the K was used, uh, just applied to each symbol, uh, but it's actually, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we use every time the same K and only for one symbol at a time. And that was actually super weak because now uh, the, the side text, the, the resulting side text doesn't hide that much about any of the underlying plain text anymore. Um, and we will see in a bit, that uh, we can use some st statistics about uh, a language that we know um, to, to still be able to recover what the original message was, uh, just, just by analyzing some statistics on the, on the cipher text. Um, and again, here, languages, you should think of the formal or computer science formal term, so a language with any alphabet, so it could be an artificial language, it could be a computer language, it could be a Turing language, it could be a natural language. So it could be English or Spanish. So a bit important, a bit background on um, statistics on languages. So if you if you have a corpus or a great selection of books and uh, or written text, you can just uh, count the recurrence of every character. So uh, maybe uh, in English, the letter A, because it's just already a word, uh, occurs uh, very often, but also um, uh, well in other words. But actually, if you count for every letter that you encounter in, uh, in all books, uh, you will see that actually the letter E is most commonly used in English. And the letter Q, I believe, that's what's correct, is used uh, the least amount of times in uh, English. And you can compute this for different languages. So, for example, you can also compute this for Spanish. So, here you have, of course, now 27 letters. Uh, and apparently, in Spanish, you don't use the letter W isn't that much indeed. And the very you don't use the cat that much. I didn't know. <laughs> Maybe it's the C way more often indeed. Yeah. And then here you also see the letter E is also just very important, but the A as well. And for example, in English, the difference is way bigger. So if you already know, for example, well, I'm just skipping ahead a bit. <laughs> if you already know uh, something uh, about the SARS text that it's uh, that the original language was maybe English or maybe Spanish, 
you you can you 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 can derive something from the frequencies but we'll come to this in a bit i first wanted to say that actually on this website it's a it's not not the nicest website that you'd say but it's a, it has some resources about breaking for Osiris as well and i use this website most because it has a really a large collection of already um, letter frequency. So you can uh, search letter frequency for, um, for English, Spanish, you know, Hebrew, Russian, whatever. Question for ancient languages? For ancient languages? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, but of course you can, if you have a set of ancient languages, you can you can make this. Actually, I, I did once myself, I downloaded all the Google books, uh, the, the, Google Books uh, has this. Uh, I didn't download all the Google Books, by the way, but I, I downloaded uh, Google Books as a corpus of all words and how often they appear in which area, in which uh, year, even. And I just process all the data, and then you can actually have, oh, okay, the frequency shifted in over years, et cetera. It's really cool. And Google Books has also for Hebrew. Uh, Spanish, probably Italian, English, American English, and there's also, of course, difference. The better you know what the, what the language is that something is uh, encrypted in, the better you can also uh, determine something statistics about its language. So if it has this weakness that it's not encrypting properly, then get up from uh, knowing what, which language already exists. Was there a question online or uh... okay. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um yes, I think this is it. Um I want because I don't speak Spanish, all the texts that I use are in English. <laughs> Or maybe uh, and uh, non so actually for the for one of the assignments there will also be just a PNG or ping image. Uh, so there you can actually also know already a bit about how the header looks like of a ping image, uh, and you need to use that in order to recover the entire image. Uh, but it's uh, fun. At least I I enjoyed the last uh, assignment a lot myself. I hope you enjoy it too. But it might be a bit challenging, so that's why I also allow everybody to work in pairs. Um, but you will see it yourself uh, once you get that assignment. So this is just uh, some languages. They have frequencies. The letters have frequencies in languages. But now, if we get to the ciphertext like this. So maybe it's a, uh, it's a, uh, we know it's a uh, shift cipher, uh, just with this plus uh, encrypted like this. And uh, we only see uppercase letters. So we, we think, well, probably it's encrypted with uh, just uh, only uppercase letters. We don't see spaces. So probably there are no spaces in there. Everything is just concatenated JSON. Uh, well, can we find something out about this message? So what we can do is what I've done here is this counts how many times the letter A occurs in this text. So apparently, no, no, no time. So I also don't see quickly any A. Maybe. Well, maybe one or two or none indeed. And apparently, the letter V occurs quite often, D, 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 indeed, so there, the letter V occurs quite often, so there's a spike in there. And uh, what we know from normal English, the, the distribution of letters is completely different. So the V doesn't occur very often, but the E, for example, occurs way more often. So what if, now we can form a hypothesis that maybe the, the V maps to the letter E. So we can now compute like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have to have nine steps forward in order to uh, in order to 
uh, decrypt. So, uh, and of course, uh, in order to encrypt, uh, well, you can also compute like this number of steps, which is just minus 17, or at least I have it here. Yes, minus 17. <laughs> and, uh, so, what do you have? This is a, a change picture now again. So we now shift the cyclex, and now we see that these these bars, this histogram, actually line up pretty nicely. So we see sort of the same pattern. So these um, these are low here. It's low here. There's some peaks, peaks, and this peak. So maybe we already found the key. So if we try and meet uh, the nine, I don't think I have on the no. On the slide anymore, but actually, if you you can uh, decrypt it yourself at home if you want. To, you know, I have no clue what original text was anymore, but probably it's just from some book because it's just text from books um, to, uh, as an example. Um, yeah, so this is this is a really simple way uh, we can break that uh, that message, but. This was done manually, and we had to draw all these uh, bars, and then you could compare, and we use our own eyes in order to see does it match up, does it shift nice. Um, um, so there's actually the question is now arises: Can we make this more formal? Can we come up with a real uh, algorithm or more theory of how, uh, when, when, when do these bars? A line of the best. So basically, the question is: Can we have a definition for something which, which a number, uh, which tells us whether these differences between these two bars is is small or is big? So here it should be small, and here it should be big. And if we if we can if we can do this, of course we can ultimately search for what's the best key can candidate. Is that clear? Because if we had to minimize these differences between the bars, then probably it's the best fit to the distribution that we're looking for, namely the English distribution. And then probably that's the decryption. We also found then the, the so we, we know how, how many letters to shift. And we know then how to decrypt the message. So that's the idea. So now this formal definition on how can we define when this the difference between these two bars is low. And that's actually called the statistical dis distance. So it's a distance like any other distance. It's a metric, if you know the math. Uh, and uh, we can uh, we define it as follows. So we have two random variables. So one in the example was the English text, and the other one was the cipher text. Though technically the other the cipher text was not a random variable because it was completely deterministic, but we just assume it's a random variable with these distributions, but we actually compute them by like the frequencies from the frequencies. Um, and what we do we um, yeah, so for uh, so we define the sentence and distance as the delta, the delta between random variables. And what do we compute? We compute uh, for all uh, values that appear uh, that uh, that for what the random variables are not non zero. So, um if, uh, the, so we, we only look at um, uh, uh, the, for example, if we're looking at the English text, we only look at the letters A, C, so C, and we don't look for uh, uh, the number nine because we know we only look for the, the letters A, C. Uh, that is the combination of these two. So, um, well, yeah, it will make it clear and hopefully uh, we reach the next uh, part of the so we just compute the probability that uh, one of these uh, random variable equals uh, some value, let's say the letter A, minus the probability that the other uh, random variable equals the same value. So for example, the letter A. So that was basically this what we saw here, pinning the, 
because we now compare just the two bars for the letter A, so it's leftmost bars. And then we just, uh, we added this to a program into here and a program into here, and we just compute the difference between them. And really, we just take the absolute value because we don't, we don't care whether the difference is in this direction or in that direction. And then we sum up all these values, and then we have our number uh, for uh, the, 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 the di difference uh, between those two. But because we want to have some nice properties that it's between zero and one, we just divide it by two. Of course, it doesn't add that much. We can put here any of that. Um, ah, yes. And so formally, to define what is this step B is the set of all possible values for adding uh, random variable X and Y. It's, uh, the, 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 the values that make X and Y non zero opportunity. Um, okay, what's written here is statistical difference is a quantification of how much overlap uh, there is between these two random variables. So, indeed, that's just this, uh, this difference. So, now when we see this uh, definition, it's maybe always nice to think about what are the extremes, what are the values, uh, what are some properties of this uh, definition. So that's on this next slide. We actually see that it's bounded uh, by uh, zero and one. So this statistical difference will always be give us a number between zero and one, both included. Um, so maybe let's let's just I'm not sure if everybody follows immediately. So let's let's see if that's really true. So um, maybe somebody from his class already knows uh, when when will this this difference between be zero? When there is no difference, correct? And you have a different level. You said that when would we expect that the statistical distance would be zero? Yes, so when it's zero, when the it's itself, right? Yes, when itself. That's uh, that's exactly, that's the only way. So uh, when when the statistic, when the, the random variable x equals the random variable y, if it's they're, they're the same distribution, they have exactly the same uh, distribution. So basically, if we do this minus this and it's always zero, then we sum only zeros and we get zero. The other thing is maybe a bit more tricky. Maybe if it give you a slightly longer time to think about it, but can you think of when will it be one? Maybe to give you a hint, it's the statistical distance is a scale. So zero means there were identical the distributions, uh, and maybe half of you there. Yes, there are two extremes. So what's the other extreme? If there, are, the one extreme was they're completely the same. The other extreme is twice as much. What do you mean between twice as much? Because there are random variables. The the one is. To be one, it has to move B plus two. So that's why. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So because we divide by one, so we need to get a sum here of two. Right. True. Yeah. But if you if you don't think about the formula, just think about the the, the, the what it means. So uh, if it was zero, then we were completely the same. These these distributions we had them completely the same. And now I think what's the opposite of completely the same is completely different. Yeah. So it means that they have absolutely no overlap. So if we had maybe just two uh, two letters, an alphabet of two letters, then the, the one had maybe a probability of one always A, and the other has probability always B. So then uh, we have here, so we fill out the letter A, and well, then this is probability of B one, uh, probability of the first distribution is one because it's only the letter A. And the probability of the second distribution 
the, the container letter A, so the probability is zero. So one minus zero is just one. And then now we need to look for the letter B. Well, the first one didn't have it, so that's zero. The one only has it, so it's one. So it's minus one, take the absolute value. So we have one again. So one plus one is two. And we divide by two, and we get one. So the bit better feeling of why, uh, what the statistical distance means and why it's bounded by zero and one. And actually, this is, I believe it's even the first proof you have to do in the homework assignments. So if you pay attention to this, you can already write the first uh, proof down. The other proofs I won't give, but uh, they go in a similar way. Uh, so for example, uh, another property is that the, this, uh, this statistical difference is symmetric. So it doesn't matter if we compute the statistical difference between X and Y or Y and X. At least that's what I claim. It's for you to prove in the homework. <laughs> and uh, well, there's also another nice property often seen in math is the triangle inequality. So the distance between uh, X and Z is less than or equal between the distance between X and Y and Y and Z. So now we have a triangle like this. Then uh, this distance and this distance is always bigger than this distance or equal. Um, let's see what the time says. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I will just finish this topic on statistical distance and then uh, maybe have another break. Um, so we saw that example before of this architect. So I use this architect again, but now let's not break it visually, but with uh, this uh, statistical distance. Uh, so I've already done the hard work. My computer has done it, luckily. <laughs> but uh, so if we, uh, we now, how do we now solve this uh, to in an automatic way? is we just compute the statistical distance between these two uh, things for all P candidates. So we just decrypt it under a certain key, and then we compute the distance between the two, uh, the two output start text, uh, plain text, sorry. Um, so uh, we'll see, well, all these th distances are quite high, around half. Um, and there's one that's really different. These are all about hot, and that's the nine. And we already saw visually, indeed, nine is a really good match where these bars line up. So that's basically the non out of the of and uh, let's see what I wrote here. Hot. Um, so this is just on formalism again. So for language en in this language and uh, decryption under some k. Uh, um, yes, we look at the candidate's decryption. So we, what, what does it mean what we call a candidate is because we just try to decrypt under that key and it's just an attempt, it's a hypothesis and we choose the best candidate. Then we will check manually uh, if it is the correct decryption or uh, maybe the second best uh, candidate we can also try. But uh, here it's clear that it's really uh, uh, yeah. one question. Uh, in that case, there is a probability. So yes. it could be nine, the probability, but it could be the key. Yeah, yeah. So if, uh, so, what you would do here is uh, well, maybe not here because here the extreme, the, the it's pretty really sets out according to the rest. But maybe if it's or maybe if there were two like uh, point twenty five then you would look at both of them. You would first look at the first key candidate, try to read it yourself. If you see that it's indeed English text, you know you solved it. Uh, otherwise, you try the other one. If that didn't solve it, then maybe you made an error or something else. But uh, you then you, you can try uh, a bit more things. 
And of course, here again, also the weakness is there are only 25 or 26 keys. Uh, so here you can also enumerate brute force all uh, keys. So, but th there are some examples where you actually, the key space is too big, but you can do, still do the statistical analysis. Did you take a chunk of it? Yeah, you can. Uh, if, for example, if you have an completely encrypted book, you you could do it for the completely compute uh, the letter frequencies for every uh, for the complete book, but you can also just do it for maybe the first page. I mean, uh, and you uh, nice Yes, yeah, yeah, but usually that's already enough. In uh, assignments, uh, I also encrypted uh, the. Um, uh, so the Latin session, there will be also a paid um, a section from a book encrypted under this uh, this uh, vision gear cyber actually will come to that later and you have to uh, break it yourself. Uh, maybe stop here and uh, have a short break. Let's say... Um, Let's say 10 past uh, seven, because uh, then we have a bit shorter break, but we uh, we catch up again uh, for the longer break we had uh, before. And then we will continue with uh, the weakness of the pit cipher, and then we will quickly, it won't be too long, uh, we also cover the vision air cipher and it's the uh, permutation cipher, but that's just one plot. Okay, so we'll see you again in 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, uh, did you tell? Uh, ah, okay. Uh, I can also, if you, if you loaded this slide. Yes, thank you. From there, you can just enter stuff. And then, <laughs> from there, you can just enter stuff. And then, from there, you can just enter
Okay, hopefully also everybody online is back again. Uh, so uh, let's start again with uh, the weaknesses of the shift cipher. So for the shift cipher, uh, you could ask about, well, is it the key phase? Is this correct? Yeah, it's still the shift cipher, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a key phase large enough and not to bring a relationship. No. Between the plaintiff Sartex, well, the answer both is indeed no, because, well, the key space was just 26 for English, uh, and uh, for uh, what well, we've seen that it doesn't hide the letter frequencies. So now, uh, just one slide or another, so we can maybe extend the shift cipher, in, like we extend the Caesar cipher into shift cipher, we can extend the shift cipher in a permutation cipher. And what is the permutation cipher? It just says, well, it commutes a letter in the plain text to a letter in the cipher but we just replace A by Y, but we replace it B by A or some other letter. So here we apparently replace B by C, C by B, and uh, A was something, something else got replaced by the letter A. Super miss. Break the, the frequency on in some kind of way. In some kind of way, yes. Yes, this is the this is harder, although it's also not a super secure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, actually, if you the for example, AES is just a permutation cipher, but it's done in a super complicated way in order to have a small key and still have a very unpredictable permutation. Okay. And so you can actually make a quite secure permutation cipher, but you have to take care on writing down the key. And that's actually the next slide, is how would you write down a permutation? Well, if you, uh, it's easiest to do it just with numbers because mathematicians love numbers instead of just the letter A, etc. cetera. Uh, so you would replace the one by an eight, and two by three, and et cetera, and nine by seven, and then you could write it in such a way, like a sort of matrix, one by eight, two by three, uh, nine by seven. But mathematicians are a bit lazy, and they think, well, this is too much to write down. So they write it down in a slightly different way. And this is a bit more involved in order to now like uh, uh, how you have to read it. So, I have highlighters here. So one is replaced by eight, it's just straightforward now. But now uh, we don't go from two is replaced by three. We just look at five out by eight is replaced by okay, six. And so the next one is six is replaced by nine. Nine is replaced by seven. Seven is replaced by four. So this is just how you write it. So you, Often people, if you look at permutation cybers, it's just written like this and not in the other ways. So for permutation cipher, we can again ask these two questions like we just did for the shift cipher. Is the key space large enough? And does it uh, break the relationship between plain text and cyber Well, maybe first, yes. The relationship between plain text and cyclics. Yes, it is done correctly. <laughs> uh, and the key space, uh, well, yeah, and it's just right. Uh, exactly, it depends. But um, again, for a theoretical part, it's if we increase the, the key space by one, the another, or uh, sorry, if we increase the, the key length. So this thing we put on the Turing thing by one, we actually get a faculty more number of possible keys. So actually we we increase the key states super quickly. So uh, if we just have 26 number, uh, our alphabet cost is 26. We can choose 
goal, that the first one can go to 26, the letter A can go to 26 other letters, but now the letter B can go to 25 other letters, and the letter C can go to 24 different uh, options, etc. So we, we have lots of possible keys. And that's why actually the key space is, is from a clear, if, if your key is large enough, then it's super huge. So this is actually, the key space is really good. So it's, it's, it's really good. Normally you would get it maybe uh, that's exponential, but here it's even faculty, factorial, uh, secure. Um, so we can write it like this, yeah. Super uh, slide, so the key space wasn't large enough because it didn't hide the scientific script, right? Uh, no, that was, uh, that was, here it says it doesn't hide the playback and letter accuracy, that's the relationship oh. between, but the key space here is just 26, and if we increase here the key length, yeah. it will increase the same amount, the key space. Oh, so, yeah. and, Maybe uh, hopefully we'll steer away from the beginning. This is just the, the, the number of elements in the set, right? So the number of elements in the key equal the key space equals the latex space equals 26. Okay. Thanks. Actually, I don't know why I wrote there latex space. Uh, let's uh, just ignore that. I'm not sure why I wrote that because it's super. Ah, uh, actually, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's a bit unclear notation what I wrote here, but uh, uh, actually the key space is indeed the playback space factorial, because here we had the playback space was just 26 characters, and when we have 26 factorial number of keys in order to permit. So, and now here is why I wrote here, it doesn't hide the playlist and uh, doesn't hide the frequencies between the permutation, but ah, that's indeed true if you if you, if your permutation is always the same. That's it. That's why. Well, uh, for example, AES, then you if you, we will see it in a few lectures from now, but you will actually use your key to change permutations all the time. So uh, but here, uh, if you just use one permutation, yes, exactly. But you cannot use for several permutations. You for could one for one second. Yes. Yeah, you can. That's but you now invent something slightly more involved encryption scheme. So you could, for example, do okay. the first letter you uh, permit according to the one permutation. Second letter, second permutation. Third letter again for the first permutation, etc. But uh, that's a, that's a variant, uh, and it, you have to consider you increase your number of your key will come double the length. If you use two more permutations, your key becomes also double as long. So it, it, whether it really adds security is is to be seen because well here already uh, the, the the key space was already large enough. And if the key space isn't large enough, then doubling it also doesn't doesn't make it large enough. So it doesn't get you that much security additionally, and it also it's also not getting that the worst. So yeah. Yeah, one yes, well maybe because of context then yes, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So in that case, it would be better if we had uh, and then we have more permutations. Like if we are two, so we have to do two times the permutation. So in that case, the person could identify the cipher, but now the number of times that you repeat the permutation. Yeah, but they're, they're all just variants. But the, we actually will just the, the, the next slide, we will just cover actually one of these variants for the shift cipher. Which is called the Visionaire cipher. And but we will also see that's not secure enough. We can also break that. It's, it's a bit more involved, but we can also break that. So let's move on to the next one. Ah, actually, first, yet another one <laughs> um, a substitution cipher. 
which is also just simply to explain instead of just permuting between one alphabet, we just map it to a completely different alphabet. So we are writing it in smiley faces. So that's, yeah. It's a, this is just a definition of the thing. But of course, here, here you have the exact same weakness, right? The, well, the T space is just uh, uh, sure, it's random. It's a one to one relation. Yes, it's a one to one relation. But it's, well, if it's a complete, well, it's the same types of keys that you can, number of keys that you can have. Um, but uh, what and uh, the the but it doesn't hide this like letter frequencies. So now we come to this uh, Dijonier server that I was already uh, hinting about. Um, so Dijonier was actually it's, uh, we now took a giant step in time. Dijonier was a French guy, I believe. I believe in yeah. <laughs> In the 1600 or 1700, I don't maybe 400s, I don't know, but then quite some time from Caesar, mm -hmm. but still also quite some time from now. And it, he came up with this algorithm and it was unbreakable at that time. Nobody knew how to break that one. And it took really like, uh, I don't want to say any number again, but <laughs> it took many years yeah. in order for people to figure out how can we actually break this. And we will already cover this, how to break it in this one hour. So, <laughs> um, okay, so the, what, what, what's this uh, cipher? How is it defined? So, instead of, so it's the same thing as the shift cipher where we use this uh, notation. The only thing that we change here now is K, uh, this key. Uh, we, we just choose a key uh, uh, different each time. So um, uh, if we have a key of length three, then the, the first plain text character will be uh, encrypted under the first character of the key. Second character of plain text will be encrypted under the second char character of the key, etc. And uh, the, the fourth. Character of the plane will be again encrypted under the first character of the key, our key is length three. So we just compute modulo our key length, uh, the, the index on the on the message. Um, ah, yes, and one interesting observation, and that's actually why it was unbreakable at the time. Is that if you have two, uh, the, the, the letter A, for example, two times appearing in the message, it doesn't necessarily map to the same letter. So, this letter frequency, you can now not easily use anymore. We can still use it, but not that easily anymore. We will find out in a bit. <laughs> so, just an example again how this uh, Vigier cipher works if you didn't quite catch it. Catch it. So uh, if you just use the normal uh, uh, plus operation again, model of something, so the H, or uh, well, first I should explain this. So we just put our P, if it's 93, then we can just put here A, B, C, and, and again, here put A, B for the rest of the, of the message that we want to encrypt. And now in order to encrypt this plain text character by character, we just increase the letter H by one. So um, it should be an I. And indeed, we'll turn it to I. The E will now not be that, but the G and uh, well, etc. And what's now interesting to find is we have here two times the letter L, but it maps now indeed to two different characters, not uh, two times an L. So we break slightly, or here we break very well already, the, the letter frequencies. But like I already said, we can still break the Fizinier cipher. And we do this actually in two steps. The first step is to determine, is, is, an, is to try to find out a way of determining the key length. And once we know the key length, so the uh, we can just, um, well, uh, 
the match every every lesser region is encrypted under the same key, under the same index of the key. So the everything that's encrypted under the first letter of the key and everything that's encrypted under the second letter of the key. And there, these letter frequencies are just distributed as normal English text. Well, they won't form words, etc. So we cannot immediately read what it says. We know it's still following the distribution of natural languages. So we can then just solve all these batches individually. So that's the, that's the approach. So first determine the key length, and then we can just solve it like we already solved for the normal shift cipher, but we now we have to solve it n times for a key of length n. Uh, what did I write here? Determine how likely it is. Uh, ah, yes. So this is how do we, um, what is the approach to determine the key length? Is we need to find a way of determining how likely it is that two randomly chosen symbols in the text are identical. We will see in a bit what this really means. Namely, we again have a definition for this, which is index of coincidence. So coincidence, how likely it is that two letters are the same. Um, what do we do here? So F and I is the number of times uh, the I symbol occurs in the, the alphabet. So for example, F A could be the number of times the letter A occurs in the alphabet. Um, in the text of length then. Um, and then we actually can compute just this, uh, this, this index. And then it's, what, what do we compute here? It's exactly this probability that how likely it is that two letters are the same, because here we have fi divided by n, so that's the probability of one letter, the, the probability of a single occurrence, the letter frequency of one. And then for another one, which is different than, uh, so we, we can choose one less. And also, of course, also the, the, the number of, of the length is also one less. So now we just, that's sort of the intuition for how this formula works. It's just giving you this, yeah intuitive way of how likely these two uh, symbols are uh, to be the same. And we can also compute this index of coincidence for just an English text. So in an English text, how likely is it that two letters are the same? We just sample two letters. Well, we can actually, if we have again this giant corpus of uh, all books uh, like Google Books, etc., we can just compute this with a rough estimation because probably we don't want to compute this all the time. But if we choose a large enough n, so if we choose a big corpus, then uh, this uh, this n and we can just cancel out against this one and this one against this one, and it's probably f f i squared. So, uh, well, we sum for all the letters. And for English, if we compute this number, we just get this. And this, this number we can also compute basically from this letter frequency that I saw before. We actually computed this number. By the way, maybe also interesting to know, uh, I'm not sure if I said it uh, with all uh, on, on recording and with all of you. Um, the, 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 the book by Naima Swart actually use slightly different letter frequencies because he used another source for letter frequencies and he also derives a different type of index of coincidence. But I mean, they're roughly the same and that's that's the most important thing. The languages change a bit. Uh, if you have a different corpus, then you have slightly different numbers, but the, the, the gist remains the same. So just to keep that in mind. And for the homework assignments or actually lab assignments, I don't mind which which source for letter frequencies you use. Um, you can use the ones from the slides, you can use the ones from the book, you can use something else if you find some other source. Um, yeah, 
But the interesting thing again is this uh, index of coins. Uh, index of coincidence is again a, a sort of a statistic for a language. So for English, it will give you this number, but you can also again compute it from Spanish, uh, and it will give you this number. Maybe more interesting is to look at what if we didn't have a natural language like uh, English or Spanish, where there some letters appear more often than others. Um, if we have a language where every letter occurs as often as any other language. So we have again a uniformly uh, at random language of let's say 26 symbols, letters, tokens, whatever. If we then compute the index of coincidence, then it will be a super uh, low number. And so this gives you a bit of an idea of, well, if you have a super uniformly random, so super random language, then it will get a low number. And if it's apparently, if your language is not that random, so you have uh, high bars, uh, only a few lows, then apparently Spanish is less random or there's less, uh, the, the probability that there are two letters are the same is higher for Spanish than for English. There are just some numbers, but we uh, can apply them um, in order to find the key length of uh, the Pigeonier cipher. Um, but first, I guess there's just this uh, observations or properties about the index of coincidence. I already mentioned the first one, so it can serve as an identifier for a language. So if you just have some random text and you compute just the index of coincidence, then you get a number and you can see, ah, oh, okay, it's uh, around this size. Maybe it's English, maybe it's another language, or maybe it's just random garbage. Um, so the, the index of coincidence is also, it will remain, the, the, the number, the, the number that we compute will remain the same if we apply it under a strict cipher. Because for example, if the letter A will always map to the letter C. It doesn't, so the, the, the occurrence of uh, C and C or A and A doesn't change if we just shift the letters. So uh, just with some nice terms, it's then just it's invariable, so it remains the same. Your mode of alphabetic substitution, meaning that we just replace one character by the other. Um, if we change other model alphabetic substitution, so like we did with the Fischer cipher, we, uh, a letter like in hello, the letter L could map to the letter M or the letter O, I believe, in the example. Um, there, there actually the index of coincidence changes. So we can, by observing this, we can actually now uh, come up with an algorithm of determining the key length for the uh, Vizinger cipher to break it. Maybe it's not so obvious at first, but uh, I'll try to help you in the lab assignment in order to uh, to uh, use these properties to, to to use this index of coincidence to help you to find the key length. And then once you find the key length, there was the second step where you had to uh, determine uh, just break and uh, uh, sh shift ciphers in a row. Um, and if you do, if you program this correctly, so there will be in the lab session, there will be first an assignment where you have to just break a shift cipher. And then later there will be an assignment where you have to break a Vizier cipher. And you can use your code from breaking the shift, shift cipher then also in breaking the Vizier cipher. If you first have to then determine the key length. Try this. Um, I think the assignment is clear enough by itself, but of course, if there will be uh, questions about the lab assignments and you really are stuck, don't uh, be afraid to uh, ask uh, for uh, clarifications in that Slack channel. Um, in order to 
break this fishing air cycle. Um, there's one more thing I need to explain. And a certain uh, definition as well, in order which you can also use in order to uh, uh, determine the key length. And that is where you can actually use the hanging distance. And the hanging distance is the number of positions which do, yes, at which the corresponding symbols of two strings differ. So I actually have an example here. So if we have the, so the distance, but now the hemming distance, not the statistical difference distance between hello and helix is actually, well, we have two different uh, characters. So there are just the hemming distance is two. Also we actually use in computers, we just use some binary data. So there in the hemming distance is actually uh, just on binary data, and well, here there are also just two things different. And if you think about it, you can actually there's also another term which is called the Hemming weight, um, um, which is basically just the number of ones uh, that you have in a in a in a bit uh, or in a byte. Sorry, uh, and you can. Uh, the Hamming distance is e super easily calculated using the Hamming weight because you can just store these two and then you have only the differences. So you just have the ones. So if you store these two, this one, uh, the zeros won't change. The ones will cancel out and will become zero. But only for these ones where there are differences, they will, will appear one. So the Hamming weight, you can just then count how many ones there are in the byte. Also, I know. But this is also uh, something you can use in order to uh, to uh, break the vision here. So I think it's more. I think it's it's a bit difficult to explain how you do it exactly. So that's why I chose uh, it to make it as a lab session. So you're really hands on yourself, um, and uh, you really get your hands dirty to uh, to see. Uh, uh, how does uh, how you really break this yourself? So, so, so you said that the counts once is that the hanging distance? Sorry. So the hanging distance is between two two things. So it could be two words, but let's take binary because computers are binary. Um, so then um, it's just the number that, that the number of positions where the two words differ. Mm. So here there are just two positions where they differ, and the having weight. Yes, I said it correct. It's just if you have a uh, that's if you have a bit string, uh, how many bits are one? So we finished a bit earlier uh, than uh, than I thought actually. Uh, so again, here the lab assignment uh, contains more uh, details, and then I only want to uh, uh, close with a recap of what the homework is. Actually, I forgot to also put here the lab assignment on. But uh, so first, uh, please read chapter seven of uh, cryptography made simple, the the book that uh, we use. If somebody uses this uh, cryptography and introduction book, the old version, then uh, the chapters don't necessarily match up to uh, uh, to each other. So you have to, I guess nobody will use it, but uh, as I say, anyway, if you use the old version, then please look which chapter matches the ancient uh, ciphers. Um, so the homework will be due next Monday. This one, this time, uh, there will be, yeah, it will be next Monday. And then uh, for Thursday, there, there won't be, well, maybe I will release the homework on Thursday already on Thursday, but then on Monday, there will also include already the homework on Monday so that you, again, that Monday next to that one, you have to hand in that one. So, but uh, this is just too complicated. Uh, just forget about it. <laughs> The first homework set is just due by Monday. <laughs> Sorry.
can have all the presentation in tech -tech. This is already on the uh, tech data store, and it was also sent on the um, Telegram group. It's also in the Telegram group, yes. So, where are the your device? And in the team, too. Yes, okay. but uh, I will also upload them to Slack because there are some people who don't have access to yeah. the okay. uh, Then there is also an optional uh, elective chapter if you want to read it. It's chapter eight. It's about the Enigma machine. It's completely useless uh, if you want to read it because it's ancient technology. Nobody uses this anymore. I try to read large chunks of this. But then uh, it's, uh, I find it a bit too boring, to be honest. But maybe you will enjoy it a lot. And you, if you like to know, know, know more about history, uh, about cryptography, then it's really cool to read. And uh, you have to realize we now only covered maybe up to the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, uh, well, 17th century, whatever, uh, just some time ago. And then in the next step is indeed. World War One and World War Two, where the Enigma was invented, and then pretty soon afterwards, they, we we arrive in the era of modern cryptography with deaths from uh, the eighties, I believe, and uh, well, also uh, RSA, which was eighty seven or seventy eight, sorry. Um, so that's the time. So uh, just again. The lab section is also uh, already uploaded on tech and we'll also upload it to the Slack. Um, and that's due in some time. Uh, but be sure to start soon already on that because it will, it really it might take you some time to program everything and uh, understand exactly how you break the phishing yard cycle. Okay, so that's it. I hope to see you uh, on Thursday again. Thank you. I Basically, yes, I think it's a good one. Oh, yes, 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 it's a good one. Are you going to have the classes done at the same time? So, no, the classes will be pre recorded yes. oh, then, and because, because of the time zone difference, when I'm in Europe, and I would also have difficulty. <laughs> so, that's why I will just open with them to Mayo on YouTube, and then you can watch it from there.